Hi there and welcome to Plant CEO. In today's episode, I'd like to welcome Josh Tetrick, the co-founder and CEO of Eat Just. Hey Josh, how's it going? It's going good. I hear some bird song in the background. Uh, some roosters were crowing a few minutes ago. You'll probably hear them. I'm in uh, the island of Kauai, which is the, the oldest island on the Hawaiian island chain. Um, and uh, this is where I've been spending part of the part of the pandemic. So it's going well. That's awesome. It's not a bad place to be. I remember Maui from uh, my uh, honeymoon, actually. So I wish to visit there again, uh, probably next year, I reckon. Yeah, no, you got you got to come back. It it's uh, it's a place where um, you know I think if the planet was left wild as it should be, it would look and feel and sound a lot more like where I am today. That's awesome. Are you getting to do some surfing? Is that is that one of your things? And not surfing as much, but lots of swimming, lots of hanging out with sea turtles and awesome. uh, experiencing the reefs out here. We're by um, the Anini Beach Reef. Um, so there's a, a lot of a lot of marine life. Uh, it's in a beautiful reef system out here. So system got uh, affected with the whole changes with what's going on in our oceans and have you started to see less fish or how is it looking there you know this is the the first time i've really experienced the ocean in this way in my life uh, that's one of the you know the the bright spots of the pandemic for me it's really given me an opportunity to be in a place like this um, and i had experienced the ocean more as you know hanging out and throwing football throwing a football on the beach and, you know, wading in a little bit, but this is the first time I've really been, um, uh, been experiencing the ocean in a, in a more immersive way. So I don't, I don't have any, uh, anything to compare it to, but, um, you know, it's a pretty special thing when you can work hard all day. Um, and then when the sun is going down here, um, yeah. you can swim with a hundred million year old sea turtles that saw both the fall of the dinosaurs um, and the rise of human beings and all the while they've been doing their thing and it really um, kind of puts things in a perspective if i'm worried about something that someone said to me during you know a particular day uh it uh has a way of grounding you so it's it's pretty special for sure and i guess on on that note um you must have seen the recent uh seaspiracy and previous films like Racing Extinction and uh, The Cove, ex et cetera, explaining, especially around bycatch for things like sea turtles, which is such a shame that's that's going on right now. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's yet another example of how human beings often unintentionally are creating a world that we don't want. Um, most human beings, I think, including the people that are swimming with uh, sea turtles later tonight, um, look at those animals and feel a deep connection with them. And just like I think most young kids, when they see a cow or a pig, feel a deep connection with them. We end up creating abstraction around those things in a burger or in a chicken wing or uh, in turtle soup, and it removes the connection. Um, and I think, you know, whether it's chicken, beef, pork, cows, or... Um, or, or turtles, there's a there's obviously a different way to go about it. Um, and, you know, that's what we're trying to do. Mm. I, I guess supermarket packaging makes it look so much different than what, what it used to be, right? Th those products which had souls and feelings and, a, and a, a life of its own. But when it gets removed that way, you don't see that association. Yeah. If, if anyone is looking to um, obscure um, the fact that we um, unfortunately bound so many of these animals to suffering, unfortunately, we use a third of our world uh, to plant soy and corn. Um, that's how we choose to spend uh, the very limited uh, area of earth that we have. Abstraction is a good place to start. Um, abstraction is the best way to hide cruelty. It's the best way to hide the lack of reason. It's the best way to hide the lack of kindness. Make it really abstract. Put it in a package, wrap it up in a nugget, um, and all of a sudden you lose all those connections. You lose a connection that you have to the rainforest. You lose a connection you have to that hundred million year old animal. You know, unfortunately, that's happened 
way, uh, way too often, but that doesn't mean it has to stay this way. No. And do you think that can be changed in schools, start to teach, you know, subjects around climate change, around animal farming? I know uh, a few authors who have written books that are aimed at children to try and bring that connection back. Yeah. You know, and the way we look at it is any significant change in society requires more than one thing. Um, you know, I was just reading an article in the Times the other day about how um, our lifespan um, has um, doubled uh, in the last uh, handful of decades. Um, and it's an extraordinary accomplishment. Uh, and the author of the, the piece said, um, if there was one headline, sort of multi-decade uh, headline, that you would have in a, a multi-decade long newspaper, it would be human lifespan is doubled, right? But we forget about that. One of the, one of the biggest reasons um, is the elimination of smallpox. Uh, in the 70s, there was an announcement that smallpox has been eliminated. Well, how did that happen? Well, a lot of different things happened. Policymakers changed. We changed our personal behavior. Uh, there are advances in technology. And all these things came together to create something that, um, you know, made the world um, significantly healthier, saner, safer. Um, and it'll require all sorts of things to move the world away from industrialized animal protein, from uh, making sure that our kids are educated, to investing in technology, to policymakers, to communication channels like this. All of it is required in order to create a context in which this is meat, right? Where you don't need to slaughter a single animal. You don't need to tear down a single tree. You don't need a single net in order to enjoy the beef, the chicken, the fish that human beings tend to, tend to want. Hmm. And if you were to think back to when you started Hampton Creek, um, has the acceleration of the plant-based trends been faster than you anticipated? I think the acceleration um, overall of, of plant-based and cultivated meat has been around what I hope for. Mm -hmm. um, I, I wanted it to be, um, you know, when I, when I started and I told my friends and family that I wanted to make an egg out of a plant, um, almost to the person, they thought it was um, a pretty stupid idea. Um, when I told people that we wanted to get into making slaughter free meat a handful of years ago, almost to the person people thought uh, that was a silly science fiction idea. But like all ideas that seem dumb or very strange at the time, whether that is um, a motorized vehicle instead of a horse and buggy, whether that is streaming music instead of owning your own music, whether that is uh, lab made diamonds instead of mine diamonds, whether that's a phone you can put in your pocket as opposed to a phone that's connected, all seem bizarre until they're not, until they're normal and they're pretty boring. Um, so it's been, uh, it's been great seeing how that, how those mindsets have changed. Yet at the same time, it's sort of this paradox because two things are true. So one is you've got all this capital, all this energy, and all these hundreds of millions of consumers who have opened up themselves to a new way of eating. That's good and that should be celebrated. And at the exact same time, more human beings are eating industrialized animal protein today than they were yesterday, and more will eat it tomorrow than they are today. Both those things are happening. Both are equally true. Um, so we don't, we see our task, um, as one in which I, I believe that, um, meat without needing to slaughter a single animal is an inevitability. What is not inevitable is how long that will take mm. is that a hundred year journey. Is that a 10 year journey And every additional year that we add to it are tens of billions of more animals, hundreds of millions of acres of land increased probability of zoonotic disease, more carbon that goes up in our atmosphere, and a food system that's even more divorced from what I think we all think the best of us is. So that's why sooner is much better than later. Yeah, for sure. And when you read the book, The Fortune at the Bottom of the Pyramid um, by C.K. Pallard, it changed the way you were thinking about things. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that did happen? Yeah. Um, before reading that book, 
I thought the most effective way to um, change something, the most effective way to have an impact on society was through a nonprofit organization um, or an international institution like the UN. Um, and nonprofits and inter international institutions can be incredibly effective and they have a, an important role to play in this. Uh, but I totally neglected the role of capitalism. Um, I looked at business um, as something that, you know, maybe you do if you want to make a little bit of money and then you give it away as opposed to something that's more fundamental in changing things. Um, and he, in that book, opened my eyes up to what I think the most effective way to move things is through capitalism. Now, you can move things off a cliff. <laughs> or you can move things in a way that's restorative. And that depends on your intention mm. uh, initially. And then it depends on the business model and the technology and how you build it. Um, that was a big change for me uh, because then I got really focused on how do I figure out a way to use my life through this system that we call capitalism to try to improve the state of things. Yeah, which is awesome. And it's, it's, so, it's so good to have a really strong mission, but also to make brave moves like you've done already, right? To invest in the cell-based meat side, for example, when everyone was saying, what are you doing that for sort of thing? So you kind of need to have that, that drive in order to do it. Yeah, it's so, um, even for folks in the space, I think it is, genetically wired up in our way of being as humans to have a hard time seeing what our world will look like 10, 20, 30 years from now. We're just not made to do that, right? So in 2001, there was a poll of Americans and it was asked, what percentage of you can see yourself um, streaming music as opposed to owning it? Yeah. Percent of this country said, I can imagine a world in which um, I would stream instead of buy. Yet in today's world, 87% of the music listened to in the United States is streaming. Yeah. 20 years ago, General Motors was fighting tooth and nail, or maybe even 10 years ago, fighting against the transition to uh, electric transportation. Yeah. Yet a few months ago, they announced that they will only be making electric cars right these things change quicker than we than we realize um and we go from this kind of a binary to oh bullshit that's never going to happen to okay this is normal and boring that happens pretty quick um yeah. and it's going to happen with this so firstly um just wanted to say th congratulations on on the raise for for good meat which is obviously your your cultured meat, cell-based meat uh, division. Um, you also previously said that you could see how that can prevent the next pandemic. Can you explain a bit more about that and just explain for the people who don't know what the process is to create uh, cultured meat? Yeah, well, I'll first start talk about um, uh, an example of a word that creates abstraction, uh, a word, um, and the word is, zoonotic disease, zoonotic. COVID-19 is what's called a zoonotic disease. And most people just glaze over when you say that because they think you're going to get into a, you know, a, 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 a thesis on um, epidemiology. All a zoonotic disease is, is a disease that spills over from a non-human animal, like a bat, or a chicken or a pig to a human animal, often because of things that we human animals do. That's all it is. Hmm. And the things we do include stacking up animals in cages in wet markets or crowding animals in tiny spaces. They include directing bulldozers to knock down rainforests and disrupt habitats. We do those things and then diseases that are in those non-human animals they spill over to us. And that's what happened with COVID-19. That's what could happen with a future H5N1 um, outbreak. When you eat animals in the way that you do, you simply have a higher risk of those things happening. 
Um, if you decide to eat animals in a different way or not eat them altogether, well, then you have little to no chance of a zoonotic disease spillover. Because instead of having a whole animal crowded together and needing all the land and all the water, you start with a cell. And then you identify nutrients to feed that cell. And then you scale it up in a, a, a process that looks like large scale fermentation or something that looks akin to a microbrewery. You're cutting out those elements that lead to a higher risk of zoonotic disease and focusing on those elements that give you what you and I want, which is it's a really good chicken breast for dinner. Um, and this is a way that we can have our meat without having our masks on at the same time. And I, I have found it so interesting, this COVID-19 thing that I think most people sense like something is amiss that COVID-19 wasn't by accident. You know, no one tripped over uh, in the lab. It came from somewhere and it came because of things that we do, but we have a hard time placing that. Like, what does that mean? Things that we do. It literally means that we go into natural habitats and we disrupt them. And often the primary reason we disrupt them is because we like to plant soy and corn not for us, but for the pigs and the chickens and the cows that we eat. Yeah, it makes and no it's, sense. It's pretty bizarre. I mean, imagine being an alien um, and flying over the planet Earth and then ask yourself, well, how did these human species down there use this only planet that we've run across for a million light years? And then another one says, what well, seems, sir, that they're using a third of it to plant soy and corn. Oh, for themselves. No, 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 not for themselves. Well, for who for? For the animals that we eat. It is a bizarre way to build a food system. No one would ever build a food system like that from scratch, right? You would only do it because of a set of habits that, you know, that extend throughout a number of years. Um, but I think increasingly people are waking up to it. Yeah. And so what has been the response to your good meat now that you've had a few sort of successful launches and high profile places in Singapore? 88% uh, of people said they feel good about uh, eating it. Um, folks have called it smart meat. Uh, there's a lot of confidence that people derive from the fact that SFA, the Food Regulatory Authority in Singapore approved it for human consumption. Um, Overall, two thirds of folks that we surveyed in Singapore and in the United States said they would remove their conventional meat and replace it uh, entirely with this. 82% of restaurants said, assuming the cost was right, they wouldn't need to have conventional meat on the menu uh, anymore. 71% of people said it tastes as good or better uh, than chicken. Um, and Madam Fan, a Cant Cantonese restaurant, went a step um, beyond just putting it on the menu, but they said uh, during particular times that were available, they'll actually remove chicken from the menu. So if you're hanging out with your friends and you queue up Madame Fan on the food delivery at Food Panda, um, the only chicken and rice dish that is available is one made from chicken that wasn't slaughtered. And we think that's indicative of the way the world will eventually look. That's awesome. And do you... Is it stated that it's like cell based or do they have to explain that part? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is stated that is uh, the, the term in Singapore that we use is cultured. OK, right. Um, more, more globally, we're going to the word cultivated. But in Singapore, right. it's used, we use the word cultured. Right. Uh, so people are aware of it. Um, and uh, and, you know, we, we've also asked consumers not just what you like, but what you know, makes you hesitant about this. And what we hear from them is, I don't like the word sell. Okay, right. I um, want to know more about the process. Yeah. You mean it's manufactured in this large stainless steel vessel. What is this vessel? Can I see inside the vessel? Right. Um, are you certain <laughs> it's not genetically engineered? So these are really fair questions that that consumers have. And, and it's important that we continue to address them. It's entirely non-GMO. Uh, yes, you can eventually touch and look inside this large stainless steel vessel. We could imagine live streaming, uh, producing millions of pounds of meat at some at some point uh, in the, in the future. Um, yes, it does come from a cell. I know you might not like that word, but we're all cellular creatures. Everything does derive from a cell, and that's where we start. So I think some people will be able to sort of get over the strangeness of it initially. 
Mm. And some people won't, but it eventually, um, I think, uh, with, with time, I think, uh, the vast majority of people will, and will, will be eaten better. Yeah. Do the waiters go around with like a little photo book and, and show, it shows you the insides of the, like the tank. Here you go. Here you can have a look. <laughs> oh, so they, they, uh, we're, we're developing a pretty cool interactive platform where people just click on the link and, and, uh, and see it themselves. But We've tried to do um, a, uh, a more intentional job of educating people during this go-to-market in Singapore um, so they realize, you know, it's not just chicken on the menu, but it's chicken for um, developed for a particular reason that the current way of doing things doesn't make sense. We've all been there, right? In the grocery store. Oh, I'll just buy this meat. And there it is, and all we have to do is buy it. We don't have to think about what it took to make that chicken in, in that nice packaging. But the reality of the way that it came about, it's incredibly unsustainable. And that's one of the biggest problems facing humanity right now. Um, and so far, so far, so good. And we'll develop, uh, you know, uh, hopefully if we do our job, effective ways of communicating this when we eventually roll out in the U.S. and Europe and China, too. Yeah. Do you, do you think you will obviously would have learned then from what's worked well in Singapore? Do you think sure. their, their culture will reflect in the same way in the U.S.? Mm. Uh, and have you done similar surveys there to find out what they think about it? Yeah. Yeah, so we surveyed 2,500 people across the U.S. and Singapore, um, mostly similar, some differences. So there's more of an awareness of cultivated meat in Singapore than the U.S. That's one, about 50 percent versus low 30s. Hmm. Uh, there's more of an awareness and a concern around food security and food safety in Singapore than you'll find in the U.S. Yeah. But a common... Yeah also import a lot right so they're they're not naturally growing things so they're that's one of their top priorities isn't it that's right but but a common um feeling among a singaporean or u.s consumer that listen i want to eat meat and i don't want to feel bad about it you know mm. there's no reason that someone should feel i shouldn't feel bad about getting into a truck right I shouldn't feel bad about eating a chicken dinner with my family, right? We don't have to feel bad about these things. It's understandable why I don't have a truck right now. I would love to, I'm, I'm excited to see what uh, Ford is doing with their, like, what Tesla is doing with their cyber truck, with RIV, what the electric car company Rivion is, right. is doing with their adventure vehicle that's coming out. You should yeah. feel good about getting in a truck. Right. You should feel good about your chicken. You don't need to feel bad about these things. And I think ultimately this both allows people to feel good about it. That's why we call call it good meat. And then for the people that don't care either way, eventually it'll be more cost effective and it'll taste the same anyway. And and they'll end up doing it just because because the price makes sense to them. Yeah, maybe um, we need to have a similar video where you've got a cyber truck pulling against the the old <laughs> the old Ford trucks and you have one of your chickens versus one of the old <laughs> imagine I, I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama. Right. If I if I asked, you know, any number of years ago, say ten years ago, if I did a survey of um, you know, people that I know in Birmingham, Alabama, and I said, um, so could you imagine um, sort of ever hauling your, you know, your construction material with an electric pickup truck 10 years ago, they would have laughed and been like, you must be crazy yeah. to ever think you would do that. Because an electric pickup is slower, it's not manly, has a little to no horsepower, is going to break down. You must be crazy. Yeah, yeah. Ask those, ask those people today. Ask those people many of whom probably put down a reservation for the uh, for the lightning, many of whom probably put down a reservation for the Cybertruck because they just, they're better products. Yeah, you can see how much load it can carry and, and the torque that it has and obviously right. makes sense, right? 
So thinking now about, I guess, the acceleration for your new division. And if you think about companies like Meat Tech is creating meat from 3D printers, uh, they mm-hmm. recently acquired a piece of meat, so it, uh, which is a, a cultured fat technology company. You know, are you looking at potentially acquiring? Um, and if so, what sort of companies will you be interested in? Well, we're, we want to do anything that gets us closer to the day that the vast majority of meat doesn't require slaughtering a single animal. So that's everything from investing that $170 million in building capacity, uh, accelerating research and development. So we'll eventually launch beef and pork um, and other animal proteins, building a brand around it. And when there are opportunities to um, fill in gaps in our technology, expand what we're currently doing across cell line development, media or infrastructure, we're do it. So we'll always, um, our eyes are always open to see if, to see if that makes sense. Yeah. You mentioned media there. Um, what, what do you mean in terms of media? So the, the nutrients that the cells consume. Oh, so, okay. Yeah. So okay. everything from how we get the cell, the nutrients that the Go cells ahead. consume to how we scale it up. Um, and, you know, I think that, uh, this industry, this new industry of making meat without needing to slaughter an animal, um, has, I think there are about 80 plus companies now around Mm -hmm. the world, uh, in it. Um, and I think, uh, I guess a, a few things are true. One is, um, I think I wish more companies would start. Um, I think it's a, just an awesome area to be in. It's a great place to, to spend one's life. Um, I don't think every company is going to succeed. I think it is more capital intensive than most appreciate. I think it's more complicated, particularly the fact that you're serving a real food product to a human being and you have to build a brand around that too mm. than one uh, would think. I think you're going to have uh, a number of companies that end up specializing in one of these components as opposed to attempt to do everything. I think a lot of the companies will find it's just too capital intensive they're liking and they'll you know go on and do something else. Um, and I think it has a lot of similarities to the car industry in 1903. In 1903, between 1903 and 1913, you had over 3,000 car companies, mm. over 3,000. Um, and then when the 20th century, uh, um, the 21st century came around, um, you had about three. Um, and it wasn't because those companies didn't have a vision. They were right. But there's more to doing this than just being right about the vision. You've got to execute the technology. You've got to scale it up. You've got to raise the capital. You've got to build a brand. You've got to handle regulatory. A lot of the boring stuff that is just the guts of how you build a company. Um, and that's the challenge to make sure we do that. Yeah. So let's say now in, in 10 years, if you're looking at uh, potentially chicken as well as chicken, beef and pork, how much uh, of that amount will be sold, um, will be cult- cultivated? Um, mm. so, um, and how long will that, you know, 50% take to get to in the US and globally? Yeah. Well, my goal, I have a, a niece named June. She's two years old. Um, by the time June graduates from high school, um, which will be about 15 years, um, assuming yeah. she graduates a little bit early at 17, <laughs> um, I want the majority of the world's meat not to require slaughtering a single animal. Um, and that's what our objective is. Um, and that, that means... Um, It'll need to be more than one company. It means we'll need to execute really well. Um, It means, and this is, I don't wish for this. I think it's unfortunate. I I do think probabilistically you'll see more than one new zoonotic disease pop up in the next 15 years. I mean, it's just probability. Um, And I think these things along with capital, along with the development of highly differentiated products, um, where culture shifts will create the kind of context that we're seeing for electric cars. Um, I think cultivated meat will, in a short period of time, will be where electric cars all are today, where you'll hear some of the biggest meat companies in the world say, I'm moving forward with only making this. 
not necessarily because they care, no. um, but because <laughs> it's just a more efficient, ultimately a more profitable way of making animal protein for consumers. And thinking of Europe, um, I think you're quite optimistic uh, that you will have a European launch before the end of this year. You're sort of gaining acceptance with the regulators. Um, which countries will be first and where are you looking to also manufacture? So we'll, I don't think we'll uh, launch cultivated meat in Europe before the end of the year. It's just egg, you will. That's right. Yes. Our goal, our goal is to launch just egg before the end of uh, Q1 next year. And our partner is PHW. They're a major poultry company in Western Europe. So they're going to do the manufacturing um, and the distribution of just egg across, uh, across Europe uh, for us. Um, cultivated meat in Europe will take a bit longer. Um, so I think that'll be a uh, more of an uh, uphill um, road to work with regulators to show them why it's safe for human consumption. But I think we'll need to see the U.S. first there, uh, and then probably one or two other large countries, and then uh, and then Europe. Where do you think it might be after the U.S. if if Singapore, U.S. and then where yeah. else could it go next after that? I think I think the likely scenario is U.S., China, um, you know, one other large country, whether that's a Brazil or an India, uh, a Saudi Arabia, uh, and then Europe. Oh wow! Okay, yeah, that's going to be. I mean, those those big markets are where we also need that change to happen faster, especially with with China and India for sure, where yeah. so much uh, is on the rise there. Thinking about still on Just Egg, um, now that people have got used to working from home, and do you see that there's a blurring of like meal occasions, you know, people having breakfast at dinner time? Like for example, my neighbor, he likes to get this all day breakfast kit from the supermarket. And I know they don't do a plant-based version yet, but if that were to happen, and if that is happening, that's mm. quite good for Eat Just, right? Where you can consume your products in any time of the day instead of just breakfast. Yeah, you know, we sh we haven't done any study sort of comparing the the um, the day the times during the day that were consumers are that they consumed just egg before right. pandemic and and right. in the midst of pandemic. So I'd be I'd right. be purely speculating on it, but I, I've seen a few of those uh, anecdotes also in my own life, just talking to friends and family. Um, I do think long term, though, in North America, at least, eggs are primarily eaten for breakfast. That's where 70 plus percent of the eggs are consumed. So I, I do think the majority of consumption will continue to be, at least in North America, in Western Europe at breakfast time. In China, for example, most people eat eggs for lunch or dinner, not breakfast time. Okay. Um, the most common uh, egg dish in China is uh, tomato and eggs. The most common egg dish in the United States are scrambled eggs and, you know, salt. So um, different day parts, different uh, applications. Um, but uh, but so as long as we stay focused on how do we run towards being the lowest cost egg, the best tasting egg, the healthiest egg, the most sustainable egg, what do you think will be the dominant egg? Um, if we don't do those things, then, you know, we'll, we won't do anything that we want to we've got to keep pounding on those really important metrics. Yeah, and I know that you love your stats. So can you tell me how many plant-based eggs um, you have sold the equivalent of um, and what that saving is in terms of the CO2 taken out of the air, and, you know, the billions of gallons of water that was saved? Yeah, I'll, I'll put it in perspective so you guys don't think we're too good. Um, <laughs> two trillion eggs were laid last year. Two trillion, the most consumed animal protein, thirty-three percent in China, um, fastest-growing animal protein. Ninety-nine percent of all the eggs that are consumed are conventional eggs or battery cage eggs. Now, a growing percentage of eggs are cage-free, about thirty percent in the United States, higher than that uh, in in Western Europe, which which are certainly better. Um, we've sold the equivalent north of a hundred million eggs which again, which sounds like a lot, except when you put 2 trillion next to it. Right. Uh, we're the fastest growing egg brand in the United States today. Um, it is, I, I should know this off the top of my head. I, I don't know the exact amount of carbon emissions that the the um, the total uh, volume, I can tell you, 
we use about 90% fewer uh, carbon emissions uh, in land uh, and water uh, in terms of gallons than a conventional egg does. Mm. Yeah, that's still a great amount. And I think going forward, I guess, how much do you think your success will be based on like branding versus more of the technology play, which, mm. which is, I guess it's a bit of a mix between the two, but where do you see that going forward? I think the most important thing is always you've got to, you've got to build a product as if you don't have a brand and build a brand as if you have, um, as if so you're relying only on the brand. So you, you can't, um, if we, if we think, well, because we're pretty decent at branding, that will allow us to get away with a subpar product. We won't accomplish our objectives, right? So they both really matter. Um, if I was going to choose which one matters the most, it's building a highly differentiated product, something that when they close their eyes and they taste and they look at the health um, elements of it, it's just simply better. Uh, ultimately, we want to get below the cost of an egg. An average egg is about 8.2 cents per egg. We want to get below five cents. Uh, we want to continue to push the health. We want it to be better tasting than the best pasture raised egg. So even if you have you have a, so this dogmatic point of view of I must eat a chicken egg, I can't imagine not eating a chicken egg. You're going to try this. You're going to look at it. You're going to look at the price point, and you're going to ask yourself if you want to hold that hold that dogma in your head anymore. Mm. Just like my fr just like my friends in the pickup truck, yeah. I would never drive an electric uh, electric pickup check. Are you kidding me? Those are for those folks in San Francisco that don't yeah. have the Ford Lightning. And damn, like the pickup is more, the horsepower is more. It's, well, maybe my mindset's changing here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I wonder what happens when you throw one of those big metal balls to the side of it. <laughs> see see if it bounces off. <laughs> right. right, that's right. Maybe an egg. We could chuck an egg at it and see what happens. <laughs> there you go. That'd be fun. Um, so how do you see the, the next few years panning out, uh, for the industry, um, and for eat just as well? Um, I think the next few years are uh, a challenge. Can, uh, can we and other companies, uh, continue to really scale I think companies have shown the ability to start up, uh, but can we really scale? Uh, not just to people who can uh, afford it, uh, but to the rest of us. Um, is this scaling at Walmart, right? Is this scaling at local convenience stores? Uh, is it scaling outside the United States and Western Europe? Um, I think those are things to look for. Um, and for us, both for egg and meat, uh, we want to make a whole lot more of them. Uh, we want to continue to drive the cost down. We want to build authentic brands. Uh, around it, um, and, and for egg, um, you know, we, we're looking at these metrics of below the cost of egg, better tasting, and we want to achieve all that before the end of 2023. Um, and for meat, uh, we're working uh, hard on us regulatory approval. And then China after that, uh, building a large scale facility, not just to make thousands, but millions of pounds. Um, so I, I think we'll. Well, uh, that, that's the real big challenge, I think, in the next few years, looking at scale, uh, looking at other countries outside the U.S. and Europe, um, and seeing if we can really take this thing mainstream. Yeah, I would love to see it mainstream. So, yeah, thank you so much for everything that you're doing and all the people at Eat Just. Uh, it's such an important mission. And, uh, yeah, the faster we get to this change, uh, the better it will be for everyone. That's right. That's right. That's a challenge. Thank you very much for coming on the show and speaking today. Thank you. Cheers. Bye for now. See you later. Bye. Bye.